Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Brian Stokes Mitchell, and you're listening to the Theater Podcast with Alan Seals. Hey everyone, happy hot, hot August if you're anywhere near me here in New York City. And welcome to another all new episode of the Theater Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Seals, and I am so thrilled to present this episode to you with the one and only Brian Stokes Mitchell, one of the most genuinely nice and caring individuals I've had the pleasure of working with. Again, another one of these people that embodies one of my most favorite pieces of advice that I've ever heard, which is be the person they want to work with the next time. So at one point in his younger life, he was thinking that he was going to be a marine biologist. But luckily for us and for him, as he puts it, the universe chose him to give back through performing and through the arts. And he just continues to take it one step further by diving into one philanthropic cause after another, all while getting honorary doctorate degrees and winning Tony Awards. You know, just a day in the life of Stokes. So make sure to check out the show notes for links to watch his new music video called Hope, written by Jason Robert Brown. Find the link for his recent TED Talk. And also check out Three Summers of Lincoln, a new play he's starring in at the La Jolla Playhouse that was just announced. Find me online on the socials. Tag me and Stokes in your stories and let us know that you're listening and know everyone. Please enjoy this episode with the one and only Brian Stokes Mitchell. Today's guest is someone I have respected in the industry for as long as I have ever known you could perform on stage professionally. A two-time Tony Award winning, Drama Desk Award winning, and Outer Critics Award winning actor, he is renowned for his powerful baritone voice and dynamic stage presence with standout performances in Broadway productions like Ragtime, Kiss Me Kate, Man of La Mancha, and Shuffle Along. He has become a celebrated figure in musical theater, but beyond Broadway, he has showcased his talent on television in shows like Vampirina, Wolverine, Billions, Mr robot and of course trapper john md he's also recognized for his philanthropic work particularly for his 19 years of serving as chairman of the board for the entertainment community fund a member of the theater hall of fame since 2016 i am honored to be sitting with this man right now brian stokes mitchell welcome to the theater podcast battle and thank you for that beautiful and quick introduction yeah I, now you're making me feel like i have to talk fast that was really well done thank you oh, so, sorry i get i'm not good at monologues i just i just run through it i'm like i want to talk to the speaker do you know what there was one comment that someone made on on a podcast episode years ago and they were like you, you talk to you wait too long to get to the guest get to the guest faster and for whatever reason that's been like percolating in my subconscious so oh. i try to get through the intros fast well it's good because when people intro me by the way i said please don't say a whole lot just get out get through it quick because you know nobody wants half the audience or more already knows that information anyway so so i appreciate i appreciate your speed and your and your elocution well listen it's the stuff like the hall of fame and the the chairman of the board of the entertainment entertainment community fund like that's the stuff that's really impressive to me because on top of this giant resume of credits and all of these awards you've you've got a legacy that is impactful in a way that is philanthropic it's not just um on stage and winning awards for amazing performances like that is one pedestal that you are first place on and then you've got first place on all these other pedestals which actually it's funny because in my notes here the icebreaker it, it, i wrote it as a joke but now it kind of makes sense the icebreaker question i was going to say okay coming out of the gate with the hard-hitting questions how many doctorates do you actually have <laughs> Uh, that's it. Well, now two. I have two doctorates, and which is kind of amazing, I think, for somebody who never went to college. Right. <laughs> so you have honorary doctorates. Where are they from again? So one is from Boston Conservatory, and, and uh, the other is uh, one I just received from Manhattan School of Music. And um, and I, I have to say, I was really, really, really honored <laughs> and and pleased to to receive them because these are both schools that I really respect and that really understand. I think, um, you know, what being an artist is and what it takes to be a musician and all of that. It's funny because I, I was uh, uh, I was the only one of all I'm the youngest of, of, of four kids. 
And my uh, family, I think, always thought that I was that I was nearly a straight A student. So I was going to, you know, I was a fast track to, to college. And I'm the only one that didn't actually go to college. I went back later to UCLA to study film scoring and orchestration and conducting and, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, arranging and all of that. Um, but I uh, but that was just through their extension courses. And I'm always studying. I'm always in class still. But I kind of get to pick my own teachers. I'm always studying with an acting coach, a singing coach. Uh, you know, I still take um, whatever lessons that I need. And people often ask me, what do you do best? You seem to do so many things. You write, you produce your own music, you orchestrate, you, you, you know, you, you act, you sing, you dance. Uh, what, what, what do you, what do you think is your best quality? And my best quality is I think I'm a really good student. Oh, oh, I love that. I love that. That, that is the best thing. And, and through, you know, all, all the years of talking with people and do this podcast, that's one of the things that I truly ha have learned is that the best the best people in the business, the most talented are never, are never, they don't ever stop learning. They're never, they're always in classes. They're always trying to better themselves. And it's, I think it's funny and we're, we're, we'll get into this later. Uh, but the, you know, the reason you and I like connected in the first place was over technology, which I yeah. think is completely cool in and of itself. Cause you and I have this <laughs> side love, this side obsession over technology, but yes, I want, we'll, before we, you will before tell we the listeners this, we were nerding out before this discussion. Oh, we're so nerding off, out. Off. <laughs> yeah. That's what I tell people. I, I, one of my favorite conversations I had with somebody was talking string theory, but that's a, a separate, <laughs> a separate thing. It's like my other, Hey, we'll talk about that too. Cause I love that as well. And <laughs> see, we're going off our already on so many <laughs> tangents people people have asked me what would you do if you weren't an actor and you know what i hope my answer always has been i i would be a theoretical physicist i love string theory m theory you know uh, astrophysics and all of that i i'm totally into that oh we could totally nerd out we're gonna have to have like definitely like a private lunch where we can just go into all these crazy details oh my god like That's calculating the edge of the universe is it, yes I, I love this okay okay uh so <laughs> but let, we digress <laughs> but we digress so you were born in seattle you said you were youngest of four then right so you were born on halloween Right? Yes. Did I read that right? Halloween. Yes. In yeah. Yeah. A day when uh, people dress up in costumes and pretend to be other people. What else could I have done with my life? <laughs> Born in Seattle. So then, like, if you were, when you were a kid, you were doing, uh, you said you were a straight A student or almost straight A student, um, really good at academics. But where did the performing, the singing come into to your life when you were a kid? I, well, my parents tell me, my family tells me I was singing almost before I was talking. My brother, John, uh, who was uh, the uh, second youngest, um, I replaced him, unfortunately, when I was born. And um, <laughs> But he was the one, he was like, he passed away a number of years ago, unfortunately. But he, he and I were like twins and he kind of raised me. And he was one of the most brilliant people I've ever known. He was a brilliant wit. He was incredibly funny. He was a, an electronics engineer. Um, he built theremins and synthesizers. He could sing. He could sculpt. He's a, one of these wow. rare people that his brain seemed to be wired for sound and for visuals as well. He could paint. He could write poetry. He, I mean, he was just really, really amazing. So he was the one that I remember it kind of we would sing to together we had a duet that we called the charlton brothers i don't know why but that was <laughs> what we called ourselves but we would sing songs and we would sing songs in harmony i remember singing harmony and it wasn't until relatively recently that i realized wait i was singing like harmony when i was three or four years old wow. but what was most amazing about that to me was that my brother john who was six at the time taught me how to do that and i thought <laughs> How did he how did he know that um so i consider him my god of many things because he taught me so many things and gave me a lot of misinformation about the world as well like older brothers tend to do uh, <laughs> but um but so we so i started singing and then um when I was six years old, I asked my parents, we were living overseas, uh, for an organ, they said. And I, I don't remember asking them for an organ. It must be because I heard it in church and I liked the sound of it. And they got me a fan organ. And I, I don't know where they found this in Guam or how they had this, this shipped out. And the moment I sat down at it, I was transfixed. And I sat down at it every day and other versions of pianos and other keyboard instruments probably every single day, unless I was deathly ill, uh, um, up until I was probably 18, 19, 20 years old. I just wow. played it. I was obsessed with it. And what I first was obsessed with, I found, was 
I, I really have a, a, a great ear and that's how I still prefer to play by ear. I learned to read music and everything as well. But what I realized I loved about it, I would sit down for hours with this instrument and just put different combinations of keys together. And I, I, I was entranced and fascinated by the way they made me feel different note sounds, you know, like now I know what a major chord is feels solid, you know, just a regular like C major. It feels very solid and 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 just, you know, you're it it's sure it's arrived. And then there are other chords, you know, a C major seven, for instance. There's it's got a little sadness to it, but it's not so sad that it makes you sad. It's kind of a beautiful sadness. Um, you know, every chord has its own thing. A minor chord then makes you feel sad when you yeah. make it a minor. And and I was I discovered these things for myself. It wasn't until about four or five years later that I discovered that there was something called chords that had already been invented. And I went, <laughs> oh my God, why didn't anybody teach me that? Because I was learning piano by note, like you always learn it. And I thought, why didn't anybody ever teach me that before? This is, I know this, this is so instinctive. And you see the music and the lead line, and then you get to make up your own accompaniment. That was so much fun. So, um, so that's how I got involved in 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 music, and then my uh, acting started when we moved back to the United States to San Diego, and um, uh, that's when I started studying acting. My brothers were involved in that, and my place was always music. I was playing the piano or the trombone and the pit orchestras usually, and um, and when we got back to the states. I no longer had that fraternal competition in the schools anymore. I was in a junior high school. My brother John was in a senior high school. My old uh, older brother George had already graduated, and he was the real thespian of the family and the actor. He ended up becoming a costume designer, a really brilliant one. And uh, but I didn't have that fraternal competition anymore. So they asked me, "What do you want to take for your elective? Do you want to take uh, chorus or band or drama?" And by that point, I was tired of chorus and band, and I thought, "Well, let me try, try drama. That'll be something new." Ooh. And my first scene in, in Kathleen Lund's acting class in the ninth grade that I, I reflected on many years later, and I'll tell that story later on, but I don't want to go off on too many tangents because I've already <laughs> gone off on 50. <laughs> my first scene in Kathleen Lund's ninth grade acting class was, Good morrow, Kate, for that's your name I hear from The Taming of the Shrew. And I realized that when I was watching a bunch of kids perform on the stage where I was doing Kiss Me Kate and I had just won the Tony Award for doing that. I went, I watched a kid literally come on stage and do that. It was for a competition that the city had. And he started that speech and I went, oh my God, that's the first speech that I ever learned in acting class. And here I am sitting in my own Broadway theater where I'm doing that speech every single night uh, after having won a Tony Award. Isn't the universe strange and wonderful? Oh my gosh, that's a lovely full circle moment. That's that is so cool. I love how how you people make uh, whole careers out of like just seemingly insignificant decisions like that. You're like, I already <laughs> did that for a little bit. All right, I'm gonna go try drama, and then you fell into it in a way that that obviously it just it it spoke to you in inside. And and I think there's something larger to this. I wanna I wanna kind of pull back the layers and figure out yeah what this is because when you were when you're a kid making chords thinking about how this music makes you feel you're you're already in this empathetic mode you're already in this emotional state of receiving i guess what the fundamental purpose of storytelling is right it's to make you feel something to make you go yeah on a journey. yeah and then you add the drama stated. you add the drama you add the 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 spoken word on top of it and it's kind of like icing on the cake have you ever looked back to like figure out what it is about you about stokes that really needs to have this in your life like what is it about your fiber your being um well I, you know it's funny because all through high school even when i was doing it i was doing it at san diego junior theater down there and my first role in a musical was conrad birdie and bye bye birdie it was the first time that I heard an audience and felt an audience respond in a kind of mighty way. And it was like, I could literally feel the energy going through me. And I remember thinking, oh, maybe I have something here. Cause I wasn't considering being an actor. I would thought my dad worked for Scripps Institute of Oceanography. So I thought I'll be a marine biologist. I love science. I'm a big science nerd and I love the ocean. I was raised around the ocean. I learned to swim in the ocean and hearing my dad's tales, you know, scripts and everything as well. I thought that would be a fun thing to do. Or I had other ideas, you know, or maybe I'd be a musician. Maybe I'd be a jazz session player, or maybe I would 
you know, be a, a, a session singer for commercials or something like that. But I really wasn't thinking that I would be on Broadway as a as a career. And then it just chose me. I was working at the Globe professionally before I graduated from high school. And then I literally went out. I never had to do anything else. I, I graduated and somebody called me, said, hey, I'm starting a children's repertory company. Um, you know, I'm artistic director of it. Do you want to join it? I said, yes, that's where I got my equity card. I moved up to Los Angeles. I never had to wait tables. I never had to do anything. I've always made my money acting. Uh, I never even had to borrow oh. money from my my parents. It's so it's I feel like kind of an answer to your question. It it, it om I almost feel like the universe chose me <laughs> to do it. It kept saying, here's something like offering it on a plate to me. Here, take this, eat. And then I would eat and take this and eat and I would eat. And just one thing led to another. And it just has seemed like I didn't make it happen. I always worked really hard. And I think maybe that's why the universe said, oh, let's keep an eye on him. He's really working hard at this and he keeps learning more and he keeps trying to do better. Uh, I, I don't know. That's one of those mysteries of life that yeah, that we'll find out when we die. I have something I call dead questions. <laughs> <laughs> So and <laughs> that's your podcast questions. name, Dead Questions with Stokes. Yeah. Can I produce yeah. that, please? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's part of actually, um, I've been working on a one-man show, and it's part of what the one-man show that I'm working on, too, is Dead Questions. And what Dead Questions are, my conceit, and here I go off on another tangent, my conceit is that, you know, they say when you die and you go through this, this tunnel of light, and then you, you know, meet somebody and your life is reviewed, you know, and, and then you go off or whatever, you know, and there's all these different theories of that, you know, the ancient pharaohs said, you know, your heart is weighed against a feather and all these things like that. So my, my conceit is that you die and you get to this place. And yeah, you get to review your life and, and everything with this other, you know, very um, advanced being, but as you're reviewing your life, you also get to say, wait, wait, hold on. Wait, I have a question about that. So, um, you know, when you see something like, okay, I was watching something about Sasquatch. Hey, stop. Hey, okay. So is there a Sasquatch? That's a dead question. You know, yeah. are there really UFOs? That's a, a dead question. You know, why did so-and-so not like me in high school? That's a dead question. You can literally stop your life anytime and, and ask this higher being it's the director's Dead commentary question. of the replay of your own life exactly yes exactly and you can ask infinite questions and because there's infinite time there's no time so I call them dead questions so I have them pretty much every day I get a dead question oh yeah so because my thought is as I'm reviewing my life I'll get to this moment where I went oh yeah that what about this and then I'll go oh okay stop stop okay I wanted to ask that question when I was alive that's my dead question. So, um, yeah, so that's one of my dead questions would be also, so why why did I get so lucky? Why was that my life? Why, with so many other people trying it, um, what was what was it? I must have done something good. <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I don't know what it was, but uh, that'll definitely be a dead question for me. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to the episode. What I was going to say was that I, black hole's not the right connotation. You are a, a, a power source of knowledge. You're always sucking in knowledge. And, and I think what that turns into, like your input is knowledge, your output is philanthropy and trying to leave a positive trail of energy behind you. And that's what I, I want to quickly shift over to entertainment community fund, like serving on the board of something that is made to literally help actors when they need help the most or help the entertainment fund, the entertainment yeah. community fund, as in, as is the name now. Um, yeah. Thank you. 19 years. You were a chairman on the board for this thing and yeah. led it through multiple writer strikes, which the, the 0708 writer strike, by the way, was uh, what got me to New York because, and, and got me into tech uh, because that uh, there was nothing to audition for at that time, and then that wow. led me to Google. So that was my choice uh, through wow. through all of that. So it's funny how those little things work, right? But yeah, so like, like you're saying, you... like we're saying, that'll be one of your dead questions. That's one, yeah, but... one of my dead questions of like, <laughs> why did I get into tech and not Broadway? I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, here I am doing both. So yeah, tech Broadway, exactly. Yeah. So for me on the outside. Um, you know, like it depends on on what I'm tuned into. Am I am I tuned into awards? Am I tuned into uh, performances? Or am I tuned into the business? And like me personally, literally, Alan, I'm tuned into both. So I know you from kind of both sides. I know of you from both sides. And but for you, for Stokes, like what uh, with all the all the 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 work, like you've got tons of TV, ton, uh, tons of Broadway, all these awards, all this stuff. But you're 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 always like trying to learn. You're you're an orchestrator, you're an author, 
and we can get into the children's book stuff too. You are uh, you're learning to fly, I think, if you don't already have your pilots. No, I learned to fly in my twenties. I, yeah. I, oh, I, I all right. So you're already, like, so you've always got this stuff going on. You're always wanting to learn and bring it all together. But then, why make the time? Why is it important to you to give back to the community and try to 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 lead positively like this? Because it's a lot of work. It's its own full time job on top of the other yeah. full time jobs you've got. Well, that, that's a great question, um, by the way. And and I mean, the, the short answer to it is I feel I've been so blessed in my life. And um, when I, I call it the universe, just this kind of the generic name, anybody can, you know, apply, apply whatever name for God that they worship or would like to say. Recipient. You know? yeah, yes. <laughs> but, but I call it the universe, you know, um, when when the universe uh, is so good to you and asks you, Hey, can you help out with this? You say yes. And that's what I feel. I feel I've been so blessed and, and, and have had so many, uh, wonderful just happenings and things. And you, you know, you were talking about that full circle moment with kiss me, Kate. I have dozens of those in my life. It's like so bizarre and wonderful. And, um, and I'm very aware that there, it almost feels like there's something special that's watching over me. And so that same voice that, that, uh, that, that, is responsible for those things. I also feel as the one that's talking to me saying, hey, how about doing this? And Joe Benincasa approached me, who's the um, president and CEO of it, um, a number of years ago. I was already on the board for six years before that. And they uh, asked me if I would consider, I said, no, I'm about to have a kid. I can't possibly do it. And, um, you know, I'm working, I'm already doing, I'm starting another show. And um, I, I said, Joe, I, I want to make sure I would be able to be good for the fun. I said, how long is the term? He said, the term's three years. I said, three years, I can't do three years. Um, <laughs> let's do this. Let's, after one year, I'll say yes. And let's have a meeting with each other. Because I want to make sure, I don't just want to be it by name. I want to really be useful and really do the work. And let's have a meeting and, and have a sit down and, and you and I talk is like, am I giving you what you need, you know? And is this, you know, what I was hoping it would be as well. And then 19 years later, I stepped down. So, <laughs> uh, you, you know, you know, the answer to that question and Joe Benincasa, by the way, and that staff there, it's a remarkable organization. And, and they're the reason that I stayed so long. I was actually going to leave th three years ago. And that's when there was word of this strange disease that was seemed to be going around the world. And um, that was right before COVID. And I mm -hmm. thought this would be the worst time ever to leave. Uh, I'm glad I didn't leave. And I said, I'll, I'll see this one through you know, at least. And I, I, I said that I felt like the last, uh, at that point, about 140 years that the Actors Fund then, you know, as it was first started, it, it felt like it was a dress rehearsal for when we hit the pandemic because so many people were in need, so many people were in dire yeah. straits and the fun was ready for them. And that's Joe Benincasa and that incredible staff, uh, Barbara Davis and uh, Tom Exton, everybody over there. And uh, Jordan Stroll at the Actors Fund Home and uh, the people at the health clinic, the Friedman Health Clinic, everybody was on top of it and ready to to change and help immediately. And that's the hook that got set into my cheek early on because I saw this was one of those kinds of organizations. The, the money is used very well. It's like 87 cents, I think, of every dollar, always rated five five stars on, I think, five or, or whatever the highest stars are in Charity Navigator. I wow. mean, we always get the highest ratings for, for everything. And that's just because of Joe Benincarn at that incredible staff and an incredible board as well. So the 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 longer answer than this long answer already is, is I was also born in a family of service. My my dad and my mother uh, were both always giving. Uh, my mother was a teacher, always in, in different organizations. Um, she volunteered. She was actually the first black policewoman in Seattle, Washington, um, oh, because cool. the NAACP asked her um, if she would do that because there were no black policewomen. And they said, this will break the ceiling for other people to join. Uh, that was in 1955 or 56, I think. The next black policewoman, unfortunately, wasn't until like 1975. Oh, wow. So I, yeah, I think she would have been very disappointed to to hear that. But she did that. And my mother was the exact opposite of what you would ever think of as a policewoman, you know, or somebody being in that service. She, uh, and, and back then they carried the guns in the purses and they didn't wear uniforms. And it was a very different kind of look than it is now. Um, but she always dedicated to herself to service. She was in a number of women's groups, the links and 
uh, another uh, uh, a lot of other groups that were service groups. And my father was actually one of, uh, of the Tuskegee Airmen um, originally. He taught radio code and blinker code. He didn't fly, but he flew with the pilots. And this was when it would just started. And um, and the Tuskegee Airmen became a corporation that also gave out scholarships. And he was always incredibly active uh, throughout all of his, up to his, his death at the age of 92 with that organization and with other organizations. So service was always a part of my family. It's just what we did. And it wasn't talked about or they didn't say you have to do service it's just i saw it i saw what they were doing and i saw how they were affecting people and that kind of thing rubs off on you so that's that's where that's the the organic place that came from you have to be like uh, some sort of eternal optimist i think to be okay with that sort of thing because everyone there's so much complaint there's so much uh people take advantage of others who are giving like that but but then through it all there's always the people who genuinely need the help and genuinely appreciate it and yeah. and and you're going back to um like during covid you, you very famously were giving concerts out of your window because you <laughs> wanted to help. And then I think you had to stop because also to help you had to stop because you were, <laughs> <Yes>. causing, <laughs> you were causing too much crowd outside or something. Oh my God, it got to be crazy. Yes, that I, yeah, I mean, we can get into that story now or later or not at, at all. But yes, it was, it, I, I realized during, I was just going to do it as a one-off, you know, like this was during COVID. I literally had just recovered from COVID when this started and i was sitting laying in my bed in yeah. in the in uh you know recovering and one night i heard all this noise coming from the front you know uh of our uh living room and then my wife kind of stuck her head in with her mask on you know the door just cracked you know <laughs> just a little bit and i said what's what's going on out there she said oh it's this great thing new york started seven o'clock every evening everybody just stops the what they're doing the you, yeah. you bang on pots if you're in your windows and you clap and you scream and you yell or you stop your car and you honk your horn if you're on the street you're just stopping and cheer and I, I thought, oh, I can't wait to to do that. I uh, finally was getting better and better. And I could feel this disease moving all around my body. The last place it started moving was in my lungs. But I think I had enough antibodies built up. So it didn't really take hold there. It hit every place else in my body. It's the worst thing I'd ever had in my life. Did you and have a I would pre, come, pre vaccine? That was before vaccine. I oh, was one God, of the first people. Yeah. This is March of 2020. I was one wow, of the first yeah, yeah, people yeah. like. I knew that had it. The only other person I knew that had it was Terrence McNally, who had just died of it. <sighs> and all I was hearing on the news was all these people are dying and they were setting up all these, you know, refrigerated trucks in, in, in Manhattan and they're getting ready for this surge to come in because it hadn't really started. It was like, well, ha lucky me. How did I get to be one of the first ones? And Danny Burstyn around that time also had it and a few other friends of mine. I think Gavin Creel, maybe it was, um, also had it. But you know, I started finding a few other people that that had it. So I would come into the room that I'm actually in right now. This is my recording studio as well. Um, and I would just vocalize to kind of check my lungs out to see how everything was uh, every day. And I started singing along a lot. And then uh, at, at one point we went to the windows because our, our apartment overlooks Broadway, you know, and, and I was able to join my son and my wife and we took each separate windows and I was yelling and screaming and clapping. And then one day I just felt, I think, I think I can sing. And after the applause <laughs> died down for the crowd, I just started singing uh, spontaneously the impossible dream. And people were like, stopped on the street i could see them looking around like who's singing what's going on and then they looked up and they saw me and i could see a smile on their face and they started clapping you know and i thought oh great uh fantastic that was my my way of saying thank you to dr jason kent you know at the actors fund at that, that time who who helped me through on the phone and all the other essential workers as well next day comes I'm not going to uh, sing. You know, it was a one-off, I'm thinking. Um, I'm at the window, and I'm clapping for everybody. I look down, and there's a whole lot more people on the street than I've ever seen. <laughs> Even day two, and, there were already more people? Yes, yes. And I'm seeing them clapping for everybody, but they're also kind of glancing up at my window as they're doing it. And I'm thinking, no, I, that was a one-off. I'm not going to do it again. And uh, so I uh, uh, thought, great. I, all the applause started dying down for everybody, and I reached up to start closing my window. And I heard from the street, sing the song, as, as only a New Yorker can say. So I sang it again. And then I, it just became a, a nightly thing. Um, and it, it got to the point where literally on the weekends, probably close to a thousand people would come. It was got crazy because it went viral and all the news started covering it. It was really crazy. Seven days into it, I was going to stop singing because I thought, now I feel like people are coming to hear me sing and they're not coming to clap for the essential workers this doesn't feel right anymore so i thought i'm going to stop singing and um that the day i decided that i went into a market 
uh, that's about a half a block away from me. And as before I got in the door, I, I felt this tap on my shoulder. And I hear Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Mitchell. And I turned around and, and there's this guy standing there that I never saw. He said, excuse me, I'm sorry to bother you. Uh, you don't know me. I'm a neighbor. I, I live across the street from you. And I could, and he started getting emotional as he's talking. He said, I just wanted to, to stop you and say, thank you. Um, uh, I come out every, every night uh, with my, my wife and my two sons and we come out and we clap for the essential workers. But we also come out to hear you sing. It's the one time in my day I feel joy. Oh. And I went, oh. And I forgot, you know, some, I think as performers, we sometimes forget what we do has a, an effect on people, an emotional yeah. effect on yeah. people. It's kind of what you're talking about, you know, we, that storytelling, that feeling thing that you're talking about. And I, had, I, I wasn't thinking about that. I wasn't thinking, oh, people were gathering on the street because they were able to feel something. They were able to hear a live performer. Broadway was closed. There, there was no live performance. Everything was closed. And this was one opportunity for them to like hear a live performance doing this bespoke performance for them um, just in that one time and space, just like the theater does, and give them something and then they, they could they could leave. And I realized, oh, that's, I see, that's why people are doing this. And that became actually a, a, an extra added goal in my, in my life, in my mind. What I, I realized, oh, I can kind of reconnect people, help reconnect people to their center space, to their joy space, to their happy space, to their hope space, to the positive space, even with all this crap going on around them in the world. It was an opportunity to do that. So for the next two and a half months, I did it. But then it got crazy. The cops would actually come up and stop traffic right before I started singing. Wow. It no started kidding. Getting, it, oh, it started getting crazy. And because we're overlooking Broadway, I'm watching when I start singing, I'm watching people run across the street while they're looking at me. And I'm watching people in cars driving and looking up at me. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be, this is not going to be good. I'm going to see somebody get hit by a car while I'm singing this song. This is not good. And, and, uh, one day there was a cop parked on the street before the seven o'clock hour. And I, and I opened, I knocked on his window and this window goes down. It's this young cop. And he says, yeah, yeah. What do you want? And I say, uh, Hey, yeah, how are you? I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that sings out the window every night. He says, Oh, you're the guy. And I say, <laughs> you're, I say, you're uh, the guy. Yeah. <laughs> it was literally like that. It was like yeah. just classic just Staten Island kind of cop. Yeah, yeah. Just great. And I said, uh, yeah, I'm the guy. And I was getting concerned because of all the, the traffic years. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, actually, you know, I, I I'm so, I came down here to break this up. Um, my boss told me to break this up. I said, oh, why is that? You know, well, you know, we can't keep you from singing from the window. We love you singing from out the window. We can't stop you from doing that. But nobody's social distancing. <laughs> Everybody was, you know, I, like I said, yeah, it was close yeah. to probably a thousand people, and nobody's thinking six feet apart at that point. And um, so he, that night, he actually came to tell the crowd not to be there. So that was the last night that I sang, and I announced from the window that, uh, you know, and, and thanks for the cops. I said, yeah, I'm. I said to him, I, I, I'm doing this for you too. You're one of those essential workers. You know, I'm not trying to make your life hard. I'm trying to make it more easy. I said, what would help you? What would help that happen? He said, don't sing out the window. <laughs> and that's when i decided okay I'll, I'll i'll stop tonight and then i went to hospitals and, and and sang at some of the hospitals uh you know a lot of people were doing that as well and which was really fun but that's that and thank god because i was thinking how am i going to stop singing out my window i mean these crowds keep getting bigger and bigger am i going to be doing this for the rest of my life so um but it was just ironic that i felt i was singing on broadway every single night and nobody else was singing on broadway you know, all of my other friends working in the crew, working the backstage, you know, front of house, yeah. um, on, on, in the orchestras, everybody was, everybody was at home, you know, waiting to wonder uh, when this thing was going to be over. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to the episode. And I don't know if you remember all the signs. Hey, we'll see you in two weeks. They're yeah, it was a two week first. shutdown. I remember yeah. when, when Moulin Rouge was the first yeah. to get hit, that spread through the company. And then everyone was like, oh, right, yeah, we're going to shut down for two weeks and everything's going to be fine. I yeah. Like, mm, nope. Mm -hmm. Nope. Those three weeks. Were, yeah, that was that was interesting. That was something. Yeah. So. Well, I don't so, even remember your question was, but I hope I answered it in that long. I don't time. remember what my question was either. <laughs> I've already got my next transition queued up too, because I started tearing up when you were telling the, the, the story, and um, which reminded me of my comment I left on your video. I'm not crying. You're oh. crying. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I want to thank you for leaving. Yeah, that, I want to I want to talk about hope for a second. I come to sing a song about hope. In spite of everything ridiculous and sad, 
though I'm beyond belief, depressed, confused, and mad. Well, I got dressed. I underestimated how much that would take. I didn't break until right now. I sing of hope and don't know how. So you did you write the song? No, this was, song was written by Jason Robert Brown. Yeah, he's and playing I was, in the video. Yes, and that's why I asked him to play as well. Um, uh, and when I first heard this song, I, I mean the world has been like crazy and you know it's like i feel like every day my head was going to explode from some new crazy crazy ass shit that was going on in the world that was making me think what is happening here and i could just feel my spirit getting darker and you know and feeling more and more hopeless and then i just happened to come across him doing this this song on a video from the, uh uh where was it uh the library of congress and i went <laughs> that's the song that I need right now. And so I started performing the song. I figured I need the song. Other people might need the song. And I started performing the song in concert. And, um, and I could feel other people also responding the same way. Oh, that's the song I need right now. Because yeah, there was, all, yeah. you know, no matter what, what, when you turn on the television, something was happening in the government, in local, in politics, in the world, in somewhere, everything was falling apart, it seemed like. And so, um, I, I decided actually, I, I, this was actually after uh, the Israel Palestine whole thing started, the kidnappings started, and then the Palestine, uh, you know, uh, the bombings uh, there, there uh, started. And I thought, oh, this is awful. One more thing that's like making me go, whoa, what's happening? You know, it's just a terrible situation that, that people are just in, you know, and like I think mm -hmm. of the everyday people that are just trying to live their lives and live in peace with their families and all of that. And then there were other things going on there. Of course, there's, you know, mass shootings and all of this that happen are happening now multiple multiple times a day they don't even make the news anymore they're you know they're so common it's so common yeah and and all this dysfunction in politics and all nobody's talking to each other and all this divisiveness going on so i and, and also i have friends you know i have friends that are dealing with illnesses or you know a suicidal tendencies or they have family members or people that committed suicide because they're feeling so down and right. i thought what what's a song i could record that's going to be good for everybody I didn't want it to be, you know, partisan. I didn't want anybody to feel like this was not about them. This, we all need this, you know. I may even disagree with your point of view, uh, or, you know, or what you believe or what you think. And, um, but you know, what we all need, we're just human beings living on the planet, trying to get along, trying to survive, trying to raise our families if we have them, trying to live in peace, you know, trying to get to the next day. And that's one of the things we have in common. And I really do think we have much more in common than we have not in common with each other. And I, I love to sit down with people in places that I would think, oh, I, I don't, I, I would never have talked to these people at all and always have the most amazing conversations with them. And you realize, oh, everybody's pretty much the same. And that's why I wanted to make a song for everybody. And I wanted to put it on the internet so people could share it with their friends who were also going through these terrible things or going through illness or going through, you know, uh, these feelings of depression or, um, you know, or, or, uh, helplessness and whatever it might be. So that's why I recorded it. And I, and I asked Jason, I said, Hey, Jason, have this crazy idea. I want to do this, this song. Um, since you wrote it, Hey, would you like to play piano? And I said, I just want to kind of have it so that it's available for people to share with everybody And YouTube technology is one of those amazing things that allows us to do it now. And he said, yeah, I love that idea. I'll come and do it. And then, um, my friend Dory Bernstein, uh, who, who, you know, as well, I mm -hmm. told her the idea and I said, Dory, cause she had done an amazing, uh, um, uh, documentary we of the concert version of Ragtime we did, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and the, that concert version will be released sometime soon. We're still working on that for everybody to see, and uh, the fund is still working on that. And then Dory did this follow up documentary of it, and she had a great crew. And I thought I want to hire some of her crew for this. And I told her there, I her the idea that I had, you know, and I just want to give it away. It's a song about hope. She said, I love that idea. I want to be a part of it. Now get the crew, and I want I want to do that for you. 
I said, oh, okay. And then I needed a place. And, and uh, Jason is a Yamaha piano artist. We were going to use the Yamaha uh, uh, there to have a place on Fifth Avenue. But it was the day before Thanksgiving. Fifth Avenue was closed because of the parade. So we told him, <laughs> oh, we can't shoot it there now. And I was thinking, oh, what am I going to do? And I called my friend Phil Birch, who owns Playbill. He's an old, old friend of mine. And uh, well, I actually didn't call him. We, we meet for lunch every, like once a week, practically. And I was just telling him, you know, hey, so I'm doing this crazy. I had this idea of this video but all the studios seem to be booked and you know i don't know where to find i need uh, like a house uh you know just a nice room that with a piano he said well, i have a nice room with a piano i thought i totally forgot about that i wasn't even thinking about phil in his house and so he said hey I i'll give you you know come come up and do it here and it was the day before thanksgiving they're trying to get ready for thanksgiving it became this wonderful grassroots thing isaiah uh, abelin who's a wonderful mixing engineer he mixed my album plays with music and mixes most everything on broadway now he's just a brilliant brilliant engineer and i took it to him and then um he he said he didn't want to to charge me for it. I said, Isaiah, I I want to pay. You said, no, no, I want, I want to be a part of this too. It's become this incredible thing that people just want to, they want, they want to be a part of it. And that's why I feel so blessed that I've had all of these incredible human beings that just also want to give hope to people in the world and do the same thing. And that's what I love about show business and what we do. It's like, you know, the actors and the singers and the performers get all the credit, man, we're supported by the crew, the orchestra, the backstage, you know, stage management and company management and, and the theater owners, everybody, people that you don't see. What I love about the theater is this collaboration, incredible collaboration mm -hmm. of all of these people from disparate parties from disparate parts of the world and from the speaking sometimes different languages they different religions um all of these differences and we all come together for a common goal to put on a show this impossibly hard thing to do and we all work together and by some miracle it it happens and i think it's just one of the great examples of what can be accomplished by human beings when we just sit down and talk to each other and decide, we, let's cooperate, let's co collaborate. Um, we can do amazing things uh, together, you know, whether it's it, it change anything, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, uh, curing diseases, um, uh, helping the government. I mean, all of these things. I mean, if, if we just sit down and talk to each other, so that's become part of that goal in my life as well, is I want to connect people because that's the other thing I realized singing out the window. I was watching all of these connections happening. People just feeling oh my god i'm not alone in the world i'm feeling that too and just being around other people that feel that and that's what happens in the theater when you're in a live theater performance um i remember seeing come from away and this was you know shortly after 9 11 and i remember thinking oh this is exactly the show that i need right now uh -huh. and i was sitting in the audience and looking around and i could see the audience was also thinking oh this is exactly the show that i need right now and it's a connection there's an empathy that happens there's this you're kind of with your tribe and with people and you don't know where they're from or what they believe or you know who they like or don't like or you know what their experiences have but you're all sitting experiencing something that is profound and beautiful and um and that's the joy that's what art can do and what i love about art particularly is it has the ability to change people in one epiphanal moment you can you can leave a theater a different person than you were than you walked in you can leave a museum after seeing one painting perhaps and go i thought i was the only person that thought that that felt that and you're you're, ch you're changed you can hear a beautiful piece of music or something that somebody wrote on the radio that you hear mm -hmm. and your life is never the same again and art is one of the few things that i that can do that change people in a positive way uh, it's almost always almost always I'll just say always, because I can't think of examples when it's not, it, it, for the positive. Um, you know, war, pestilence, famine, um, you know, there are other things that can also change people's lives in one epiphanal moment. And, you know, they're never the same way again, but it's in a negative way. And art has this incredible positive ability to lift people, to make people more hopeful, to make people more connected. And that's what I feel, you know, that's what I kind of dedicated my life to. And I've said to the universe, hey, use me for that um, in whatever way I can do it. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm happy to help out because you've been so good to me. So, uh, and, and to get together on this video with other people, like-minded people who feel the same way, it's just been really, really beautiful.
That's that's gorgeous. One uh, one of the things I enjoy again, going back to technology is YouTube makes automatic um, transcriptions for English yeah. and in a couple other languages. So I I turned on the transcriptions, the auto English transcription, so I could see the lyrics while you were singing, and uh, that that was so cool because it, it allowed me to connect. To literally, to, I was literally reading what you were saying as you were singing it, oh, and it great. got me to a place where I was like, oh God, this is this is exactly what I need. <laughs> because I mean, as we're recording this, this is the week that Kamala's probably gonna get the Democratic nomination, right? So like yeah, stuff is yeah. happening in politics and we need yes. a lot of hope and yes. you know, stuff is stuff is going really wrong in the world right now. And so that song hit me last night in a way that I needed. It was oh, nice. thank you, Alan. Literally last week, I chose a date, I said, because I had a TED Talk that also was released uh, on Monday, the 22nd, uh, with Lear de Bessonnet, which was also about hope and, you know, the same kind of thing. And I thought I, I should have my video come out around the same time. And um, so that's why I released it, not knowing that the day before, uh, that uh, President Joe Biden would would say he was not running for re-election, you know, have this kind of earth world shattering and country shattering news mm -hmm. come out, you know, and, and people are still going, whoa, whoa, what's going on? You know, I mean, again, it seemed like what a again, the universe just said, here you are, uh, here, here's your date, <laughs> you know, and I didn't even know any of that was going to happen, of course. And it just happened to be one of those things like sitting in that theater with that young man saying, good morrow, Kate, that's, uh, you know, for that's your name, I hear it's just, it feels like a circle that's <laughs> being connected for me. It was supposed to be that that's another dead question. Why? Why did? Yes. Why did? Well, I guess we have the answer. Why did it take so long? But this is. Yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, maybe, you know, or maybe not, because we we still have much to find out. You know, I, I like to think of life as one long sentence, but not like a not like a prison sentence, like a like a um, uh, um, word sentence, you know, and I, I like to think that it's full of commas. And with every comma, your life can make a total left turn. You can go in a totally new direction. And then I did so and so and such and such, comma, and then this happened, and, you know, <laughs> it's a comma, comma. And then I moved from Google and became a podcaster. And then, you know, whatever it is, everybody has all of these commas in, in, in your life. And you, there's no period until you're dead. That's Ooh. when the period is. And then you can look at a whole life sentence, somebody's life sentence, then you can say, oh, that's what this person's life was about. But until then, it's all commas. It's all possibility. There's all these other different directions. Each one of us can go. Nobody, it's it's not mapped out. It's for each individual person who's the only person living in their skin in this one long take. It's it's for each of us to decide and how you want to, what you want to do with those commas and where you want to place those commas, you know, because where the period comes, we don't know, but where the commas come, that's going to be up to you. So, um, so I, I, that's, that's what I, the, the way that I look at, look at, look at life. And, you know, I, all of these commas have been so interesting in my life. And I'm sure as listeners and you, you know, we're thinking about it, it's like, oh yeah, because everybody's life takes these turns that you just don't expect and take you to sometimes incredibly wonderful places too. Ha! Huh, I love that metaphor. That is, that's very beautiful. Okay. Tell me real quick about Three Summers of Lincoln. Three Summers of Lincoln. This okay. Uh, Three Summers of Lincoln is a show that I'm about to start at La Jolla Playhouse. Every uh, so often, people ask me, "Hey, when are you doing your next show?" And you know, I I get lots of scripts and people asking me to do shows pretty much every year. But doing eight shows a week is really hard, and I've been spoiled doing concerts now and doing television and film, and I really love doing those as well. And it's like, well, I don't really want to do eight shows a week, really, right now. So my stock answer has been. Well, when the right show comes along. And so I got a call from uh, Daniel J. Watts. And he said, hey, can I talk to you about something? I said, yeah. He said, uh, come out to dinner. Let's go to dinner. And uh, I might have somebody else with me. I want to tell you about a show I'm working on. Okay, here we go again. Somebody telling me about a show they're working on. So I said, yeah, because I love Daniel J. Watts and he's a friend. And so I go out and it's him and Chris Ashley is there. Also a friend, a director that I've worked with. They did Sweeney Todd with him down in, in D.C. And he directed Come From Away, by the mm -hmm. way. So they proceed to tell me the show that they're doing, Three Shows of Lincoln. It's a book by Joe DiPietro. And they're explaining it's about, you know, uh, the three summers Lincoln spent at the uh, the army home. And this was during uh, the Civil War. Uh, he, he was trying to figure out what was going on. They thought the Civil War would be like 90 days and uh, long, and it was already more than a year at this point. And it just kept getting worse and worse. And the country was incredibly divided and nobody was talking to each other. And there were all of these problems that are kind of 
parallel to the same thing that we're going through now. Mm. And so he explained that I thought, okay, this sounds kind of interesting. And it's about also Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass together and their uh, relationship because they had uh, three meetings and they were uh, uh, very affected by each other, the writings of each other and everything uh, as well. And so, uh, and, and then at the end of the meeting, I said, oh yeah, by the way, we want you to play Lincoln. And I thought, oh, okay, this is really getting fascinating now. I said, send me the script. Crystal Monet Hall uh, did the music. And so she had done some demos of it. I said, send me the demos so I can listen to the demos as well. And so I got the script, uh, you know, a few days later, and I sat down, I'm reading the script, listening to her demos, reading the script, listening to her demos, le reading the script, listening to her demos, get to the last page, close the book. And I said, crap, shit. Ah, oh, damn it. This is the one. This is the <laughs> damn it. <laughs> and I just knew that little thing that goes off in me all the time that I've learned to trust. It went off during ragtime. It's gone off. I mean, from when I was doing Bye Bye Birdie when I was a little kid, I could feel that thing. That's what I felt going off in me. And uh, it, that went off again. And it said, this is, I'm supposed to do this. And it's a really great story. Incredible music. Great lyrics. The team is fantastic. We've done three workshops. It keeps getting better and better. It started great and keeps getting better and better. I am so excited about it because also it speaks to exactly what we're going through now. And also Abraham Lincoln, what an amazing human being he was. Joe DiPietro first didn't want to write it when he was approached to, to do this project. And he called Doris Kearns Goodwin, who wrote that, you know, amazing Team of Rivals book and is, you know, a great, uh, 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 authority on Lincoln. And, and, uh, he said, Doris, you know, I, 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 somebody's asking me to do this show about Lincoln. Everybody knows everything about Lincoln. What can I write about Lincoln that he, I believe, by the way, I, this is me talking now next to the Bible, uh, there are more words written about Lincoln than anything else. It's like, everybody's written about it. It's, it's, it's kind of incredible. Huh. And he said, everybody's read about him. Everybody's done everything, you know, and Doris Kearns Goodwin said, and I might be paraphrasing a bit. She said, you know what? Let me tell you something. You should do it. He said, why should I do it? He says, whenever you have a chance to work with Lincoln, anybody who does that comes away a better person. I thought, oh, wow, that's beautiful. And that hit him. And he wrote this incredible script with it, some new information that I, I never knew before and a new way of looking at, and it's positive and it's uplifting and it's hopeful. And it's all the things that I want to be as well. It's like, here's my tribe again. And yeah. we get to do this something together. We get to do this wonderful collab collaboration and put some good, good food, some good energy into the world. Mm. So yeah, that's I'm January at the La Jolla Playhouse. I think the performances start February 18th. And uh, you can get tickets now, I think, if you're a subscriber, and they'll they'll go uh, on sale later on in the year for those that aren't. So, um, but it's me and Quentin uh, Darrington, who was Cole House in the last Ooh. revival of uh, of Ragtime, by the way, and he's just amazing. And Carmen Cusack is, is Mary Todd. Oh, me too. Isn't he one of the? He's one of my new favorite people in the world. And Eric Anderson is George McClellan. He's doing great Gatsby right now. It's an incredible cast. It's just, I'm, I can't tell you how excited. I haven't been this excited about a musical since, since ragtime, honestly. That's going to be good. Well, get, we'll put in the show notes, we'll put links to hope. We'll put links to, uh, to three summers of Lincoln. We'll put links to Ted your talk. Ted talk. Yeah. yeah. We'll get everything in there. And then, so as we wrap up here real quick, I want to play a little game yeah, called yeah. plot in 60 seconds. So give me a number one through 13, and then that's going to correspond to a show. And you have to give me the plot in 60 seconds. Six. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. That is Hamilton. Go. 60 seconds remaining. Hamilton, about uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton and his, uh, 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 his, his beginning all the way to his demise and all of the adventures he had in the, in the middle. We learn how uh, Hamilton uh, was such a huge founder of this country remaining. and kind of formed our uh, financial backbone and all of the drama that he went through, all of the challenges he faced, and he got through it as well. Incredible score, Lin Manuel Miranda. Incredible cast that continues to be there on Broadway, and um, and remaining. everybody should go see it. Although I'm sure everybody that's listening to this has, and pretty much probably it seems like everybody in the world has as well. That's why I'm using most of this time now to talk about this because because that's that's pretty much the the plot of Lincoln. I could have done. I'm uh, Lincoln of, uh, of, of Hamilton. <laughs> uh, similar remaining. people because. You know uh, uh, these these founding fathers as well, but uh, that's the that's a similar plot. All right, all right. Did I cover it? I don't know. I what did I miss? 
Five, and the sisters, four, the three, uh, I don't know. Two. Well, oh, no, I, I, well, I was thinking about them too. That's why I was kind of just using it from his point of view, you know. But yeah, the sisters are amazing, you know. And it's about also what we were talking about. It's kind of the legacy you leave behind. That you is, know, who who lives, who dies, who tells your story. You know, mm. that's a really important uh, thing. Who puts the period on your life, you know, at the yep. end of your life? It's kind of what this conversation is about. And um, that would probably be in a much more eloquent way for me to explain the plot. <laughs> <It's> just say <laughs> that line and leave it at that. But, you know, uh, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to the episode. All right. So the three standard closing questions I always wrap up with. The very first one is uh, simply what motivates you? What motivates me? Uh, uh, curiosity. <laughs> mm. I'm just curious about the world, about people, about everything. And I have a great love of life. And I, I, it's easy for me to see the good in people and the good in things. And also, I'm fascinated. There's also bad. There is evil in the world. And also, trying to understand how that all works together. Honestly, I think it's all all the same thing. You know, if we when we die, I think ultimately that's what we go to. We go to this thing, whatever you call it, and it says, you know, okay, I was all of that. I was all of those things. And 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 it's okay, you know, when you're there. Here mm -hmm. on earth, it's hard because you know, we have points of view and we have black and white and we understand opposites. That's a Taoist kind of thing, you know. But um, but that's that's it's it's just exploring and and living life and trying to share hope and 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 optimism and and good things with with people through art mm. what advice would you give to your younger self and younger younger people listening now starting out down a similar path um learn to listen to your heart and then follow it there's all kinds all kinds of body parts that are talking throughout your life and saying <laughs> listen to me i want to do this you know your head your you know you, you can think of any body parts you know um, <laughs> but what i have learned is is my heart has never ever learned uh, led me wrong and that little thing that i feel vibrating when I, I realize i always do that you can see me doing this it's a little thing i do with my hand over my heart and it's interesting because uh, in eastern philosophy that also kind of near your heart chakra as it, you know they talk about in eastern philosophy um that that's called your soul seat which holds your purpose of why you were on the planet Interesting. and i i just found that out relatively recently and i went oh and all my life I've been doing this when I feel this and all of those things, when I feel that it always feels like that's the, that's the reason I'm here. I feel like at least that's one of the reasons I'm here. It's feeding that, that part of me. I love that. All right. If you could only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want, what would you see? One Broadway show? Any show. This is the hardest question. Oh man, that is an incredibly hard question. And I could see, because I would get tired of anything if I had to see it for the rest of my life, no matter how brilliant the show was. But what would it be? I'm trying to think of something. You know, it would probably, I don't know what it would be. It might be waiting for Godot or Godot, as they like to say, um, you know, or something that I don't understand because then I would be able to chew on it, you know, or, uh, you know, the, the, the coast of utopia or some of these other, you know, very an Alan Ackborn <laughs> play or something that is like, oh, I got to chew on the language and I got to understand, you know, I, I, I don't know that that might be my cheat just because it's not one of those things that you can see. The more you see it, the more you get out of it. So what show would that be? I don't. I don't really know because there's shows that fill me up and make me so happy uh, as well. Um, but the great thing is when you see a show, it lives on in your mind and in your heart and your imagination. And you can do that on your own anytime. You can relive that show just by thinking of it. And you remember the feeling that you felt when you sat in the seat in a, in a Broadway theater and heard you know, Hamilton or heard The Sound of Music or watched Cheetah Rivera dance in West Side Story. I mean, th these are experiences like playing on that organ honestly mm -hmm. it's like what if it's uh, i think it's a my angelo quote um you know you, you you may not remember what people said but you always remember how they made you feel yes and that's what theater does and good theater especially it makes you feel a certain way you know i i, I i'm gonna cheat and say it could be anything <laughs> all right <laughs> all right you know, I, I, I'll, I'll allow it your honor okay. thank you <laughs> um so where can we connect with you on social media where do you play that game 
You know, I'm trying to get in deeper into that. No, I, I'm not very interested in social media, but I realize it, I should start getting on that. I'm on Facebook and I, I don't ask me what, what my handles are. Um, I think it's at Brian Stokes Mitchell for, for YouTube. And then I have uh, brianstokes.com is my uh, my website. So that's the easiest thing to do because if I have new things going up, it'll post on that. It'll show you the new videos, how to, all the links to to everything. And um, and I'll, I'll probably start getting more active in it now because I see the the advantage and all these things that are happening now um uh, it's you, you want to share them that's the good yeah. part of technology we like to criticize yeah. it but you know we can share it with lots and lots of people and like we're doing now and thank you for having me on your on your podcast alan i really really uh, appreciate it and all the, the you. good words you spread to that to the all of all the amazing things you are involved with and constantly busy and learning thank you for making the time to be here with me it truly is an honor to have you i i've wanted to talk to you like this for such a long time and I, I truly appreciate it thank you thank you thank you you are welcome and i'm sorry this is going to be a five-hour podcast now so <laughs> or, or good luck editing yeah. it <laughs> no we'll, we'll do part two and three and four uh whenever you know when when um when three summers of lincoln comes to broadway we'll do part two <laughs> that sounds great i would love to do that thank you take care take a deep breath make the world a little colorful